it's good messaging. It, it it's, makes you stand out. And so those are some of the elements of the copywriting marketing strategy. I mean, copywriting is really salesmanship in print is what one of the first said to somebody who's asked him, what would you say it is? And a good salesman is not pushy. There's somebody who's really trying to help you get what you want. And when it comes to copywriting, you've got to have a problem to solve. And then there's the unique selling proposition. You've got to make yourself stand out from the competition. All these, these different elements. Cold email strategy. And it is going out and saying, hey, this is what we do. And these are our results. And I think this is important. Again, still getting that strategy and story right. And then using the tactic to create leverage. Not having the tactic in the absence of the strategy and story. And I think that's a really important yeah. point that I want to pull, pull out and, and hammer home to, to listeners. You've got to get that strategy and story right. And then the tactic will work. If you just use the tactic by itself, you're going to find poor results. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of More Clients, Less Effort. I'm your host, Tim Hyde. And today I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by my good friend, Bren Eifler, all the way from the other side of the world, East Coast US. Welcome. Thank you, Tim. Great to be here. Now, Bren is the owner of IBX Digital, which you can find a link for in the show notes, and he helps businesses grow by leveraging powerful marketing strategies and tools. Bren's been in the industry for over 23 years, working with organizations large and small, and combined his campaigns have generated over millions of dollars in revenue for his clients and Bren, I'm going to just super quick I want to pull something out of your website, which is a little bit different and I haven't seen before. Guys, if you go and check out ibxdigital.com, you'll see this there. You've got a really cool little A video for one of your clients, obviously, which I like, um, but you've got a really cool little opt-in form front and center at the top of the page, which I think is an area that so many people miss. Thank you. Getting that call out. So, mate, uh, super quick. I know you started building websites as a teen in your, and you started an, a business with your brother in hi fi audio cables, which you worked out you couldn't scale. But how do we go from, I guess, this sort of early passion as an entrepreneur into where you are now? Well, it's been an interesting journey. So, it all starts with learning how to live in the countryside on a small hobby farm with very few friends, pretty isolated. So you find a lot of interesting things to keep yourself busy. And so that's where the audio cable business came from. My brother was setting up a music studio and I'm like, these cables are really expensive. Let's go ahead and just start building them, sell them, sell them on eBay. And so we did, and an interesting thing happened. We started undercutting the competition on pricing and then they started undercutting us and we started a price war. And I felt really bad at the end of it because I'm like, none of us are really making much money anyway. And now we're all making less money. So my first thought as an entrepreneur was, I'll just be cheaper and we'll do it better. Well, that story ends. And so I honestly felt bad for everybody else who had this business. And hopefully the pricing has, has reached Nick Librium again. We, we just moved into different directions and I started doing websites. And since then, it's probably a good 15 years of doing websites and then started doing Facebook marketing with a friend, selling print-on-demand products. At one point, this is like the heyday of print-on-demand on Facebook, and you might have seen a bunch of t-shirt ads. If you hate those, I'm sorry. <laughs> put one of those in front of like, you. I see the same. I see it's almost like someone's copied the script and just put a different person on it. <laughs> like, yeah, it's exactly right. And there's a lot of software side tools. hustle idea number 307. <laughs> exactly. And so what we actually did is we started a Shopify store it was just an interesting, is an interesting lesson in branding. And the people who are really successful in that business end up building a really strong brand and a strong following, people who can trust their products. And one of the things that we realized was our vendors don't have good quality control. And I think that this has kept cropping up every time I've tried to use vendors in one way or another, is if they don't have good quality control, you as the business pay the price for it, but they actually don't. It's very interesting. It's like, it's your name on the line, not theirs. And at one point, I actually had all the boxes of merchandise shipped to the office and 50% of them were just, I mean, like bad. And 
it was interesting. So from there, that was, Facebook- that was the issue with BlackBerry, right? Yeah, that's the reason BlackBerry went down. A, a that uh, AT and T got behind the Apple machine and and sort of cut them out, but then they started shipping to China and going, we need to get really cheap pricing, which affected the quality. And they finally go and, oh my God, all these things are absolutely terrible and no one wants to listen to it because it's got this annoying buzz on it. Um, and yeah. That's a really interesting point. You, 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 I want to pull something out of what you said with that, with that first business, which I think is so critically important that we have this sort of price. If you think you can do it cheaper or better quality, these two things are not mutually exclusive, right? They don't work together. You're gonna, if you're going to do cheaper, you have to compromise somewhere in order to kind of maintain viable margins. That's right. Absolutely. And we were living in our parents' house at the time, so we didn't really understand the concept of overhead, how much it costs to run a business, pay people, pay ourselves. It's just, as teenagers, big learning experience. And then the quality control thing, has that is a lesson that I have learned over and over. If you want to keep good clients and make raving fans, quality all the way. And it has to be structured. It has to be well put together. And so it's been this journey of learning, okay, how do you scale quality and it really just comes down to systems and processes obviously somebody think, has do you think that the same when I mean, we're talking about products specifically here but do you think that i guess the value we place on quality for products as equally applies to a service-based business like what you and i run now for sure and how do you how do you how do you capture quality in a service that's a great question so it depends on the service, of course. But when I look at what I do and I'm like, what sets us apart? It really comes down to the quality of the strategy and the quality of the writing. And it takes some training to, to understand what marketing strategies should look like. And that that's a perfect segue to the next step in my journey. So the Facebook business shut down when Facebook algorithms got tweaked just a little bit and our profit margins dried up. Plus, we were getting some competitor, hostile competitor stuff happening, taking pages down and sending out these, these complaint requests. And from there is, is interesting. My daughter was about to be born and the business ran out of money. And so I sat down with the owner and he's like, well, Bren, you can't, can't keep paying you because we're out of money. Facebook ads aren't producing. Profits dried up, basically. And it's the, the business only worked at scale. So if you're going to sell print-on-demand products with a tiny profit margin, you've got to sell a lot of them. And that campaign has to be dialed in perfectly and it has to be humming. If it isn't working perfectly, it is just, it's burning cash. So I left that office. I called a friend and he's like, you should become a consultant. That was his advice. And I'm like, great. What's, what is that even what, what like? Is, what is that? <laughs> what is that? And it's been a journey to understand what consulting looks like, what being a business consultant looks like. And someone introduced me to Story Brand, Building a Story Brand, the book by Donald Miller. And I read that and I realized that what I've been doing for like 15 years was I had been doing marketing and I thought I had been building a website. I thought people wanted websites, but I realized to his point, people don't want a website. They want the sales and the revenue that comes from having a website. So when they come to me and they're like, hey, Brian, I want a website. Can you build a website for me? What they're really saying is I want customers. I want to look legitimate. To have customers, you also have to have a brand presence. You have to feel like a real business. And a website gives you the ability to look like a major brand without actually having a big brick and mortar and a bunch of employees. If you have an amazing website, it's hard to tell to some extent the difference between you and, and, a, and a bigger brand. So from there, I became a story brand guide. And that launched me into this process of learning copywriting and understanding, wow, copywriting is the is really what Donald Miller's coming from, this, this hundred years of advertising, mad men kind of stuff. And I started reading Claude Hopkins and John Caples and some of these other classics. And I was like, this is this is brilliant stuff. Now, StoryBrand would apply that to a website, but it applies to an email campaign. It applies to a Facebook campaign. And not too many guides were doing Facebook ads. So I ended up kind of carving out a little niche there, doing Facebook ads with a StoryBrand twist. And then we ended up making a video, cutting a long story short, for a client. And it, it reduced their cost per lead dramatically and really scaled their business. 
And it was essentially what works really well on Facebook is a dramatic demonstration video. If your product is one of those things that can be demonstrated well. So this one was paint protection film. And so we just threw rocks on the hood of a car we scratched it and one half of the hood was protected with paint protection film and one half wasn't. And you pour hot water on that film and it becomes like new. So you could, we had this shot of with, without, yeah. before, after. Like right now, and I think you just had a really good point, right? It tells a story, which mm -hmm. is so critical that we often miss in marketing. I mean, and marketing is just this, the, the transition from before state to after state. Before your car is getting stretched, after it's not. What do you actually want? You don't want the film itself. What you want is your new car not to get scratched up, right? And you think about it, think about yourself, Brian. Let's pick let's pick the idea of a car because everyone at some point has either sort of bought or, or been in a new car um, with the owner and the owner is like, I need the other car, right? That moment where you say, we're not going to eat in the car because there's going to be crumbs there and the chips are going to fall down beside the seat or you sort of drive past that drive past that tree for the first time or the bush and it gets a little scratch in the paintwork. You're like, oh, no. And then... Six months later, you're like, ah, oh, bugger it. It is telling that story about saying, this is this thing that's kind of precious to me. Let's let's look after it, right? And I think that's a really, you, you, you make a really, really good point about this idea of how do you then systemize building that story into your thing? So if your website, and and let's face it, a website is, is not as important as it once was. You know, say 10 or 15 years ago, you needed a website because you probably didn't have a social media presence. But now you can almost get away without a website if you've got a strong, strong media presence. You could just have a TikTok channel and make money from that and a Stripe account and away you go. You don't necessarily need a website. But in terms of building that story up of legitimacy and authenticity and, and, and permanency, well, yeah, websites become pretty important. Yeah, that's true. But the, but those who have heard of ClickFunnels and Russell Brunson, they have this saying, websites are dead. And it's a great marketing term. It's not true, but it's a great marketing term. Yeah, you need to notice that ClickFunnels actually have a website. It's true. <laughs> they do also. I actually but, caught, caught Russell Brunson out because, of course, he was, he got a, he, Russell's responsible for all sorts of wonderful sayings that have, have diminished his com competition. What was the other one? It was Confusion Soft. Right? Before that, oh, they right. They literally into, changed their name. <laughs> they literally changed their name because of the Confusion Soft moniker that, that they got given. And then there's a, as a podcast, I think he, he talks about it. Um, he was reading out one of his books on a, on a podcast and he talks about how critically important his CRM is to him. Now, it's one of the most valuable assets in his business. And here he is on the other side saying, bloody confusion soft, it's stupid. You don't need CRM. <laughs> you just need a funnel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's, it's good messaging, right? It, it, it makes you stand out. And so those are some of the elements of the copywriting marketing strategy. I mean, copywriting is really salesmanship in print is what one of the first said to somebody who's asked him, what would you say it is? And a good salesman is not pushy. There's somebody who's really trying to help you get what you want. And when it comes to copywriting, you got to have a problem to solve. And then there's the unique selling proposition. You've got to make yourself stand out from the competition, all these, these different elements, right? And so how do you put quality into the business? Well, it's the quality of the writing and it's the quality of the design. And at the end of the day, it's the quality of thinking. Someone's thinking through things carefully. They have a system. They have a process. They're not just winging it. They're using time-tested tactics, time-tested strategies, really, and then applying those in the different mediums the different tactics or tools. If you have a good writer, you can write a great Facebook ad. Not every writer can do every medium, but they can learn it. Facebook has its own style. Websites have their own style. Emails have their own style. You give a good writer enough time and enough context, they're going to be able to write a great email with the right strategy. And the strategy comes down to just three simple things. All marketing revolves around these three elements and really human behavior, even down to a cellular level. It's we want to solve problems that we currently have, and we want results that we don't have, and then we have relationships. So one of my coaches often would ask when I would present to them a headline for a website, he's like, Bren, what problem does it solve? What problem are you solving? And I'd have to stop and say, well, it actually isn't really clear. He's like, well, make it clear. So either the headline is addressing a problem or it's addressing a result. But it's that quality of thought and really that training, 
that experience. It doesn't have to take a long time to get it, but it also takes someone who's who's able to implement it well. And that also comes down to somewhat taste, right? And that's why there are so many different marketers out there. But I believe that if you have a, a well-trained, proficient designer, you're going to have a good-looking website. And that's really how we've we've learned to do websites. Is it starts with the marketing strategy, then you create the the words, and then once the words are right, and we send it to the designer with some examples, and they're able to take all that messaging because it's telling a story, and they're able to add imagery to it, and then the developer takes the design once it's approved, and they turn it into a website, and the process works really well, and that works for just a lot of different things, and ads in particular need need a dramatic example like people want to be able to taste your product before they buy it right that's why samples in the grocery store work so well like that actually is really good i'm going to get some of that and there's this certain sense of especially in advertising these days i don't know if i can believe you like mm -hmm. if an, an offer doesn't land if it's missing in one of these points it's not relevant or somebody doesn't trust that they're going to get the result that you're promising them. We were, we were talking just before we, we hit record about some of the offers that we, we see in the market right now. We can book you 40 appointments per month or 50 appointments per month or 60. And what's better than 60 appointments per month? 65 appointments per month, right? <laughs> at, a, at a certain point, it just becomes this, well, okay, how much reason, what do I need to commit to that, right? And, and yes, we could actually book someone 5,000 appointments per month. But there's a lot of input that needs to go into that, right? There's a lot of resources that need to go into that. And, and you may not necessarily have those resources available to you. Or you may go, well, 5,000 appointments per month with one-legged dwarven astronauts is probably not very believable. And so we have this, you know, I think that's where the, 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 the idea of being able to craft a story in your messaging and in your copy becomes so incredibly powerful that we can put our clients into that story that becomes a little bit out of reach because they need our help to get there, but not so out of reach that it becomes disbelieved. Yes, that's right. And once once they can see the proof, there's an element there of, can we demonstrate the proof in a video? And a lot of products you can demonstrate in a video. And a lot of services you can demonstrate in a video too. Like in the example of websites, you can see before and after. And I've had designer friends, they're like, hey, how would we... Well, show people what the website looked before and how it looks now. And when you see the contrast between the two, you can really get an idea of, yeah, this, this, yeah. this worked. How does, how does this, how do you apply this in your systems? And I know you've just recently abandoned some Facebook ads. You tried it, didn't quite get it dialed in for whatever reason. A, I'm curious to know why you think it didn't work for you. And B, what have you got in your arsenal that they go, if I do this, this gets me consistent business for, for your agency. So we first started Facebook ads about a year ago, and we did get a client from it. And so the ads were revolving around that landing page that I sent you, where we have the case studies, the examples. Here's what we've done. Here are the results that we've achieved. And we can do the same for you. Essentially, you, you need a good video. And so we were promoting really Facebook ads with a good video. And what ended up happening was I had a few conversations, I had a lot of leads that wouldn't call me back. And no matter how hard I tried, they just went cold like five minutes later. And I'm like, did a human actually fill this out? So that's one interesting that happens with, with leads on Facebook. Even when you're fast to follow up, a lot of them just seem to be, at least at the scale I was running it, not responding. The one guy that I did get on the phone was doing a startup business. And so they're in a situation where they're burning cash and they need quick a quick fix. And we came in, we got them some great videos, we actually got them, got them good results with the leads. But then there was a lot of difficulty just making that campaign pay for itself. In the end, Facebook didn't work for them either, either, even though they were getting a good cost per lead. Getting those leads to close, that's the key. So they ended up going back to Google. Well, not just leads. We also want people who are kind of, exactly. this is a really important distinction. Right. Yes. Because as marketers, we use we throw around this term leads yes. really loosely. Okay. What's a lead? All right. Yeah. Is a lead a name and a phone number? Because I can go to I won't say the yellow pages because that would be showing my age, but we can go and scrape a list of names. Right? There are definitely tools out there that can give you ten thousand leads or twenty leads, right? But they're not necessarily very qualified. Right? They are right. 
in your in, in the demographic that you want to have there's a name and a phone number and, and maybe a validated address or, or email address or something like that right so the contact basically contact details i would actually put them almost in the suspects box right big maybe what we really want to be getting to and the people who are literally beating down our door i think as you said before you touched on it people who have a problem that they want solved that we like enough to want to solve it for them. That's a good point. Are they a qualified client? Because yeah. then you got to filter. And the, the theory always is, well, if I have enough leads, I'm going to get enough appointments. And if I have enough appointments, I'm going to get quality clients. Yeah, if you can keep the burn rate from being negative. And that's not easy, especially when you're just starting out. So my, in systems that I've used, I've used Google Ads as well. And I ran ads for a website. One of the first companies I started was a website maintenance and construction. We'll develop your website and we'll maintain it and we'll host it. And I got a desperate client. In fact, I got two desperate clients. And I was like, this is weird. Like the people who are responding to these ads almost don't care what they're clicking on. They just want yes. anybody. And so someone who's actually looking for you and who's doing research and they've compared different businesses and they've come back to you, that's why SEO ends up being a really qualified. Of all the, of all the places that you can get leads, SEO seems to be one that will get you pretty, pretty qualified leads because they kind of came to you. They researched you. They yeah, that's right. They're, they're literally coming to you. They're not necessarily buyers yet, right? But they're people who have searched for a particular solution found you, liked the story that you've written about yourself, and they said, yes, we'd like to talk. Talk to me about how you might be able to solve my problem. It's true. And then the other system was cold email. Yeah. And so I did this at scale and I got a great client out of it. So cold email can work. And it's especially valuable if you have a, a very specific avatar. Yeah. And exactly what that person needs and you've got the right person, the right problem, right price, and it all just kind of fits together. So that's something that I actually put on pause because Facebook ads were so attractive because I'm a Facebook guy, right? <laughs> I've done so much legacy there. It's a bit of love. Yeah. I, I run Facebook ads all the time for my clients, B2C, and I see literally thousands, tens of thousands of leads coming through. And I'm like, surely I can make this work. But it's very different when you're not well known, you don't have a strong established brand, you don't have a lot of, you don't have a lot for people to see that, yeah, these are definitely guys that I want to work with. They're putting a lot of educational material out there. My ads are really focused on, let's talk, let's make an appointment. If they had been more focused on, here's some educational material, here's a very specific system, here's a download, and then I nurtured those, that would have been a different story. Yeah. And I still don't know if it would have been cost effective at scale for Facebook, because I haven't done it, but I do know that cold email is very cost effective. And so I'm back to cold email at this point. Back to cold email. What I, what I love about your cold email strategy, and it is going out and saying, hey, this is what we do and these are our results. And I think this is important again, still getting that strategy and story right. And then using the tactic to create leverage, not having the tactic in the absence of the strategy and story. And I think that's a really important yeah. point that I want to pull, pull out and, and hammer home to, to listeners. You got to get that strategy and story right. And then the tactic will work. If you just use the tactic by itself, you're going to find poor results. It's true. And some platforms are just a lot more expensive than others for the B2B market. Yeah, now, Facebook is particularly very expensive and it's also time consuming and not much fun to work with. In fact, a lot of people are like, what? I'm not going to do Facebook ads because the leads that I'm getting are a ton of work to convince them. It's such a quick click and such a quick result. And you have to be like shooting from the hip and then you have to reel them in. It's a lot of work. And it's a lot better if you can cultivate that relationship. Yeah, and no, I love it. Let's let's finish up with a bit of a quick fire. So let's go let's go with this. How did you meet your spouse? Oh, good question. So I was in the parking lot of the church, and I had just landed after a, a trip, and I'd left home for the first time, and so ended up meeting her from a mutual friend who's like, hey, you got to meet this guy. He's looking for you know, someone who's going to this event. And there was an event in Washington, D.C. And so we were stuck in the backseat of a car for 16 hours, which is not what kickstarted the relationship. But in fact, I was determined it wouldn't. I was very unsuccessful at that. <laughs> Fantastic. If you could go back and give your 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would that be? I have thought about this a lot. And 
I would say you you need to develop a skill set and really hone it and refine it and not try to be too scattered. Now, I had a lot of interest at that time. I didn't know what I would land on, but really developing the, the work ethic and the skill in whatever you're doing, like doing it with excellence is probably the, the number one piece of advice I would give other than being able to say, get into business and learn from people who've been there before you. Because that's, I think that's where I've spent many years learning things the hard way mm -hmm. and trying to find people who could tell me how to avoid learning things the hard way. But the funny thing is everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses. And you really need a lot of people and you need a lot of, read a lot of books. I think I should have read more books at 18 as well. More books on business, more books on what works, more stories, because it all fits together to form a puzzle. Some books do a great job, like building the story brand, of fitting together all the different pieces other people have written about. But you've got a few, a lot of books are have a few great ideas that are lost in a sea of words. And not my quote. And you spend a ton of time pulling out those few good ideas, and then you got to go to the next book and the next book and the next book. Well, at the end of the day, something interesting happens. You internalize the information at a deep level because you've gone over it. Ironically, I recorded a podcast yesterday with my good friend, Sam Riley, and one of the, the, the topic was around traits of eight, traits of eight, nine figure entrepreneurs. And at a certain point, particularly when you get into nine figures, the tactics don't matter as much right, as the kind of qualities and traits that you have. And two that we picked out, A was the appetite for learning as you've got, and B was the, the ability to surround yourself with a network and fostering that network. So I just want to challenge those ones. What's the biggest challenge that you're facing in your business right now? So it is scaling. How are you Classic approaching that? So two ways. One, I'm fixing fulfillment. So putting a team in place, finding great team members, but more importantly, putting great systems around them and training. So I spend a lot of time training people and developing the systems and processes to make sure that we have a consistent quality in our results. And when I bring on team members that I don't have to be the one doing things to keep the quality high. So that having that in place is key to freeing up my time to be able to go and build more relationships, do more networking. And then the other piece of that, the fulfillment is what's going to create raving fans is the outreach and tested a lot of outreach. And funnily enough, cold email just seemed like, like I spent a long time trying to understand that. And that, that just took a lot of work to understand. It turns out it's not that difficult. But there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of challenging, just it seemed too slow. And so I wanted something to go faster. And the biggest challenge right now is just filling up that filling up that appointment calendar with qualified prospects. Yeah, it's such a critical thing, right? Let's not waste our time on the unqualified ones. Let's talk to the qualified ones as more, right? The people who want to work with us. What's one lesson that your job has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life, whether they are in business or not? It's very important to not take shortcuts as much as we want to fast track things. There are shortcuts though. And that's the funny thing. It's like almost this dichotomy. You shouldn't be looking for the shortcut, but we have such a hard time because we know that if you just tweak some things, you actually could make a massive change. But a lot of times the shortcuts come down to just doing what has been successful for others. Yeah, success definitely leaves clue, clues. Bren, thanks so much for joining me today. We've got links to Ice Digital and Bren's socials in the show notes uh, over at winmoreclients.com.au forward slash podcast for this particular episode. Bren, it's been fantastic you having on the show, mate. I really appreciate you sharing all your wisdom and knowledge. Thank you, Tim. It's been great being here. Appreciate it. Guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, of course, please like, share, do all the good stuff. We'll catch you on another episode real soon.